When we think of luxury cruise ships from history, we probably think of names like the Titanic, the QE2, or the Queen Mary, ships from a golden age of seafaring when the names of the vessels were as well known as some of the celebrities who sailed on board. But does the SS Arandora Star ring any bells? This steamship was every bit as famous in its day and even more luxurious than those other ships I've mentioned. Why then is it not as familiar to as many people? Joining me today is Ralph Gonella, a genealogy specialist from Glasgow, whose research into his own family background has unearthed a connection to a pretty shocking event that happened 80 years ago on the 2nd of July, 1940. So Ralph, thanks for speaking with us today. Glad to be here, Alistair. Thank you. Who, who is the person you've been researching? Well, the person that's most interested in my family during my research was my grandfather, Quinto Santini. I often refer to him as my hero because he was the person in our family that came from Italy over to Scotland and the result is that we're all here today. Tell us a bit about him. Where was he from originally? Uh, he was born in 1880 in a small town just outside Florence called Pistoia. Italy was a relatively new country back in 1880 when he was born. And by the time he was a young man, he married my uh, grandmother, my nonna, as we used to call her, nonna Elia. And they had twins uh, very early on in their marriage. In the early part of the 20th century, Italy was going through a very poor economic climate and immigration was sweeping the country. Lots of people were heading out to the New World, i.e. to the USA. Some people were going to Argentina, some people were going to Australia. Um, but a lot of people were coming to Britain, a lot of the Italians settled in Britain. And this was the place that my grandfather chose to come to because a lot of his fellow Tuscans had come and settled in and around Glasgow and Edinburgh. When did he first move to Scotland? In 1910, he brought the family over. Uh, that was his wife, Elia, and their two young children, Maria and Fernanda. Was he able to find work easily enough? When they came over, like most of the Italians, they fell into one or two of the catering trades. It was either going to be fish and chips or cafes. And very soon, uh, he'd opened a, a cafe along with his brother, who eventually joined them in Scotland. And the third brother came over and joined them, and they opened a fish and chip shop. So within West Calder, there was this little compact uh, Italian community uh, with a couple of chip shops and a couple of cafes. And what was the crazy thing in this little mining village just outside Edinburgh was that a total of 15 Santini children were born to the four brothers. So West Calder must have seemed like a little Italy back then. So he had quite a big family himself. Quinto had uh, seven children. Two of the children were born in Italy and subsequently another five children who were born here in West Calder. The irony was that uh, two that were born in Italy obviously stayed as Italian citizens, and their brothers and sisters, all born in Scotland, were now British subjects. And how did the war impact on the community? Um, by the time, uh, the late 1930s, the climate in Europe was changing, and... More so in 1939, when Germany obviously uh, declared war. Um, but by 1940, Italy then decided to come into the war on the side of Nazi Germany, when Mussolini decreed that he would come into the war against both Britain and France. And quite literally overnight, the lives of Italian families living in Britain changed forever. What was the British reaction to Italy's decision? Almost immediately, Winston Churchill uh, very famously decreed that every Italian male between the ages of 16 and 70 should be arrested. It was a famous decree in which he is meant to have shouted, Call of the Lot. And over the course of the next several weeks after that fateful day on the 10th of June 1940, many, many Italian men living in Britain were arrested, taken from their family, taken from their places of work, and either put in prisons, makeshift internment camps, or in a few cases were released when it was determined that they didn't meet the criteria for internment. How did your grandfather fare in the roundup of Italians? Quinto was still an Italian subject, i.e. Quinto had never applied to become British, 
he had a wife, he had two children born in Italy, but he had five subsequent children born in Scotland. But when the war broke out, he was arrested for being an Italian citizen living in Britain. And do you know what was involved in the internment process? Uh, when Quinto was arrested, he was arrested a couple of days after the 10th of June and he spent the first night in Maryhill Barracks, a temporary internment camp in Glasgow. He was rounded up with a, a lot of other Italians living in Scotland. They were taken to Woodhouse Lee near Edinburgh. They were put into a temporary internment camp there. Quite literally, it was a field with some barbed wire around it and patrolled 24 hours a day by armed guards. From there, they were taken down to Worth Mill near Bury. It was a terrible place. An old cotton mill that had been quickly pressed into the service and almost 2,000 men were housed there in atrocious conditions. And after several days, the first batch of the Italian men were taken over by train to Liverpool, straight onto the docks at Liverpool Docks. Immediately before him was this once magnificent ship, which had been one of the most luxurious cruise liners in the world, had now been painted battleship grey, had been wrapped in barbed wire, and was now in the process of loading all these hundreds of men on board to take them to internment camps. And in this case, they were going to Canada. So can you tell us about this magnificent ship they went on? The Arendora Star was a, a luxury cruise liner. It originally started out as a cargo ship, but was uh, taken up to Fairfields in Glasgow and refitted into a luxury cruise liner. Now, I can't do the cruise liner justice. This was one of the most elite ships of its time. It only took first-class passengers, 120 first-class passengers, went to some of the most exclusive places around the world, and it was decorated to the finest degree. Every night, the ladies would dress for dinner, and every night, the gents would be in black ties and tuxedos. This was the quality of the luxury cruise liner, the Arendora Star. How did it get involved in the war effort? The Arendora Star was pressed into uh, to the war effort in late 1939 and actually had seen some action before it was actually turned into an internment ship. It had actually been in a couple of missions over to France and various places down the English Channel. And its famous captain, Captain Milton, had been used quite sparingly because the kudos of the Arendora Star being such a, a magnificent ship was used in a few missions. But uh, yes, I'd seen some service. Can you tell us anything about the condition of the ship when Quinto stepped aboard? Yeah, well, I described the ship as being one of the most luxurious cruise liners, but that wasn't the ship that they went on to that night. All the beauty had been stripped out of the ship. The ship had been painted battleship grey. It had been wrapped in barbed wire. And the, the conditions on board were that they were actually put into the large areas, holding areas, the cargo holds, they were put into the ballrooms, they were put into the various places. It wasn't plush at all, but uh, they were put on board the ship. And when there were 750 Italian men put on the ship, the ship set sail on the evening of the 1st of July, uh, heading towards the top of Northern Ireland, around the west coast, ready to go out into the Atlantic and crossing to Canada. And what happened on the crossing? On the 2nd of July, it was spotted by a German U-boat, captained by Gunther Prien, a very famous U-boat commander, who sunk the Arendora Star with one torpedo. And do we know the fate of those on board? The Arendora Star went down with the loss of over 800 lives. The captain and 12 of his officers were lost, along with 45 crew members and 73 of the 200 military guard on board. 234 German internees were lost and 470 Italian internees were lost and one of them was Quinto Santini. Do we know anything of the survivors of the wreck? Um, over 800 men survived and they were picked up by a Canadian destroyer, the St Laurent, and they were taken to Greenock, uh, just down the coast from Glasgow. Any of the seriously injured were taken straight away to Mernskirk Hospital, which at that time was in the outskirts of Glasgow, for treatment. But many more of them were actually put straight onto another ship, the Danera, and they were interned in Australia for the next five years of the war. And was Quinto the only member of his own family that was arrested? 
Yes, well, that was the real irony for the family. Um, Quinto was arrested for being an Italian citizen, living in Scotland, um, while his two eldest sons, Ardeno and Raffaello, Ralph, who I'm named after, both were called up to the British Army. Ardeno served in the British, uh, the, the British Medical Corps, and Ralph went to the King's Own Scottish Borderers. Ralph was lost at Coin in Normandy in northern France on the 29th of July, 1944. So we had lost the grandfather, my grandfather, on the 2nd of July, 1940, as an enemy alien on board the Arandora Star, while his son was fighting in the British Army and died fighting in Normandy, northern France, in 1944. A real tragedy for the family. Do we know anything of what Quinto might have faced had he made it to Canada? Well, that's a, that's a great question, Alistair. That's a great question. The next ship to leave Liverpool uh, on the next night after the Arandora Star was the Ettrick, and just over 400 uh, Italian men were on board. One of them was my father, Renato Ganella, a young 22-year-old. They sailed and knew nothing about the sinking of the Arandora Star, and they endured a horrendous journey over to Canada uh, spending most of their time down in the cargo hold in very, very unpleasant um, circumstances. Arriving in Quebec, they were transported by train to Montreal and spent the next four years of their life in an internment camp on Ile saint helene right in the heart of Montreal. When my father was alive, we used to speak at great length about his stories from his time in the camp. And the one thing he used to always say to me was that when they were in Canada, they were safe. Canada was at war, but there was no war in Canada. So they had a sort of sense of guilt because they were fearful about how their family back home in both Italy and Scotland were surviving the war. There was no rationing in Canada, so they ate pretty well. And because they were of Italian background, most of the Italian um, people who he was interned with had come from the catering industry in Britain. Some of the top chefs, cooks and maitre d's from some of the top London hotels were actually eating rather better than even their captors. <laughs> what was daily life like in the camp? They had to fill their time. There were work parties. They found the Canadian winters very, very tough. Uh, and of course, boredom was a great factor. So they organised themselves in anything they could do from playing football to any sort of sport to anything educational, which might be reading or just improving life in general. At the end of the day, they were imprisoned um, until Italy capitulated in 1943. It was a tough time for him, although he spoke quite well of the treatment that he received uh, in Canada. And is the island still known in Canada for its role in the war? That's an interesting question. The, the camp... Almost the whole story of Italian internment in the camp is forgotten. And Canadians, a lot of Canadians are unaware of what was used for during the Second World War. Um, there was a little bit of a campaign just now for the history of the island to be refreshed and for people to become aware of what it was used for in the Second World War and its other uses through history. And that's something I'm involved in at the present moment in time. There's going to be a little biography of exactly what took place at, in the camp during 1940 to 1944. And that brings us on to the Italian Cloister Garden in Glasgow. What, what can you tell us about that? In 2010, the Catholic Cathedral on Clyde Street was going through a massive renovation project. And at the time, Archbishop Conti of Glasgow had decided that it would be a good idea to create a memorial garden for the Arandora Star tragedy. And he very kindly gave a small piece of land next to the cathedral over to the committee for us to make a memorial garden. And luckily enough, we got a lovely design for the garden. It was put out to tender and Julia Cirani, a young Roman architect, produced the winning design. We now have the world's largest monument to the tragedy of the Arandora Star. And can people find the names of those who were lost? On the east wall of the garden, we have the names of the 94 Italian men from Scotland who died in the Arandora Star. And it's a great place of pride for all the families 
personally for myself to see my grandfather's name on that plaque. The centerpiece of the garden is dedicated to all of the men who died on the Arandora Star. The plaque that I mentioned on the east wall is dedicated to the 94 men from Scotland who died on the Arandora Star. The main design of the garden are very large mirrored plinths. And when the, when the architect, Julia Chirani, was explaining her concept of the garden and her design, she was trying to tell us about the beauty or the once beauty of this magnificent ship. And although we said in the early part of the story that the ship had been stripped out of all its finery, the one aspect of the ship that stayed intact was the large mirrored walls in the grand ballroom. And she's now depicted this in the centerpiece of the garden, almost as plinths. And as she described it as, this would be the last image or that the men on board would have had as these large walls would have crumbled when the torpedo hit. There's also a water feature in the garden which replicates the path of the torpedo and a little water fountain at the end which obviously would have been the explosion of the torpedo. But being an artist, she countered that by saying it's now a place of peace and tranquility, that when you go in amongst these mirror plinths, then you've got time to reflect and just to have a think and maybe a prayer and a thought as you walk through, but you also hear the sound of the water just gently lapping. And when you look down, you can see that the water overspills and it's just another added vision of how maybe, you know, the, the men would have been padding through water as this tremendous ship sunk to the bottom of the Atlantic. Have there been events planned to mark the anniversary of the sinking? Presumably COVID-19 will have disrupted things. We had hoped to do something special for the 80th anniversary of the tragedy, which would have been on the 2nd of July 2020. But the garden will be 10 years old in May 2021. And we hope to have a nice day of celebration where we celebrate the fact that we now have this memorial garden. And um, hopefully everybody will be invited. The garden is open every day, all day, from 8 o'clock in the morning to 8 o'clock in the evening. We are in the process of having information boards so that the whole story of the Arandora Star tragedy and of the design of the garden, which is very, very good, can be expressed. Indeed, it's a very moving reminder of a largely forgotten tragedy. Ralph, thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. Alistair, thank you very much for listening. And as I say, my story is no different from all the other Scottish Italians. Um, it's just I'm so glad you've given me the opportunity to tell it. Thank you. So it has been 80 years since the Arandora Star was torpedoed and sank off the north coast of Ireland on July the 2nd, 1940. Each Italian family living in Britain will have their own story to tell about the tragedy, both of the war and of the ship. But you can hear Ralph's talk and meet him in person during Glasgow's Open Doors Week at the Italian Cloister Garden every September. Check online for details. My thanks to Ralph Ganella for sharing his story. <laughs>